Anxiety is not a feeling. It's the body's way of communicating that it needs help. I'm always amazed that people think anxiety is a feeling. They say, I feel anxious. They're not. They're Anxiety is, is this space in between your unconscious stuff that's coming up, like with uh, Madeline, that she's a monster and she can't have a romance with someone because he'll find out she's a monster. And then her conscious mind, which is saying something else. And so it's, it, the anxiety is this banging. It's like, like the, re, the real part, the real feelings trying to come up. And she's saying, I can't look at that. It's too terrifying. I can't look at that. I'm a monster. I have to push it down. So this loud banging is anxiety. What advice did you give her when she came to you and told you she had anxiety? Well, it took five years. So I didn't give her any direct advice. But what I said is, is something is making you very anxious. Not, and it's never, it's never, it's Hollywood to think it's one thing, right? It's usually more than that. There's usually a lot. Oh, we are in Hollywood. So I probably shouldn't say that. But, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's from a movie if you think that it's just going to be one thing. So it takes a long time to figure out what, you, what, is, what is in your unconscious down here and what is trying to get out because your anxiety is very painful and you're willing to live with it rather than know what's in here. When someone comes to you at, when, they, when you were a therapist as a patient and they have anxiety, is there any tangible tips that you can give them that'll help calm it? Be well, before we have a chance to start working, on it, I say do 30 minutes of cardiovascular a day okay. and journal, write down your thoughts and, and let your mind wander. So let, you know, in other words, you might start writing, you know, blah, 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 blah. I had a nice day, had this for lunch. Oh, I don't know why I'm thinking of my mother right now. Oh, I just saw a picture of a monster. Oh, oh, oh maybe, you know, so if you let yourself free associate, a lot of people can't do it, but if you, if you do, that's what they use in AA and all the 12 step movements, all of them journal. So I say, I say journal uh, and, and, and try to do 30 minutes of physical uh, stuff. And that'll cut down some of the anxiety, but it won't cut down all of it because we haven't figured out what it's about yet. Did When you left your sessions with Madeline after five years, do uh -huh. you feel like you really helped her with her anxiety? Do you feel like it's something that she feels free of now? She isn't free of it. Uh, in fact, we talked about our last session when she's tired when she has too much work to do, uh, when she's feeling overwhelmed, uh, she, she falls back into it. But then she'll say to herself, I know what this is about. And she'll go through all the things that we did and she'll be okay. But when she's, you know, it's like anything when you're tired, when you're, you know, when you just aren't on top of it, she'll slip back into, into anxiety again. But it's like, once you know what it's about, you say, okay, I'm going to look at this. This is my mother was constantly cruel to me. And she told me, not cruel, worse than cruel. She said, you're a monster. And she said, but mom, I, I've been successful. I'm good at tennis. I'm good at this. I, you know, I was number one schoolgirl. She goes, that's because they don't know you. I know you. Only a mother knows their daughter. I know you're a monster. Oh, <sighs> yeah. So naturally that's down here and she doesn't want it to come up because she doesn't want to think of, her, think of herself as a monster. And guess what? Everybody believes their mother. Like people often say to me, well, why did she believe that? Who doesn't believe their mother when they're six years old? You have to believe your mother yeah, at six yeah. years old. There's no other choice. There's no other choice. Right. So, you know, you, and, and her father would, you know, even though they were multimillionaires, would hide in the basement and eat SpaghettiOs because he was frightened of her. That is very interesting how everyone around her was scared of her. Do you think that's attributed to the fact that she was a narcissist? She's a narcissist and a psychopath. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Now, so because uh, she also lies. Not all narcissists lie. They, they, they will if you put them in a corner. But she, she would also, well, here's an example. Remember when she said, I, the, the wife, Charlotte, said, I need new furniture. And he said, we can't have new furniture. You just redecorated the whole house last year. And she goes, oh, no, that's too bad. Because I think we need new furniture because it's all broken. And then she took a knife and went through all the furniture. So that's psychopathic behavior. Yeah, it's more than narcissism. But also he learned to not to be frightened of her. Like, so it's easier to say, get new furniture. Just go ahead. Feelings can be deceptive. If we spend an extended period of time living in unhealthy thought patterns and feelings, they can feel natural, safe even. For me, when I have an unhealthy thought pattern, what I like to do is I like to monitor my thoughts. 
So I'll try to step outside of my subconscious and visualize and and look into what I'm thinking. And how I do that is I'll meditate. So I'll get really quiet and I'll literally observe my thoughts like an observer. And that's really helped me to sort of monitor the unhealthy thought Mm -hmm. patterns Mm -hmm. and fix it. I am a failed meditator. I've taken so many courses in meditation and I've never been able to do it. And yet it's, they say it's the most helpful thing to understand yourself for anxiety. I can't slow my thoughts down enough for, you know, to look at them. But, you know, they say, just pretend you're in a train and the thoughts, you know, are, 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 are the scenery. And then you can actually put it all together. And it's, they've shown that it can actually help heart rate. It can help all kinds of things for, if you meditate. I think meditation for me clicked. I try to do it 30 minutes a day is when I realized that for me, meditation is a strategy session with myself. Yes. So instead of just letting thoughts go by like a train, what I do is I think it's 30 minutes to be completely quiet, to meditate on the future that I want and more of like a manifestation and a strategy. And when I flipped that, it helped me to do it every day because who doesn't want to sit and just have clarity about their future? And if it works and you know how to, and if it's working for you, why wouldn't you do it? Right. Yeah. So I think maybe instead of like, if you ever do try to meditate again, instead of just thoughts as a train going by, what helped me is, mm-hmm. is it's a strategy session alone by myself in pure silence. And it's helped me sort of build out my future. It's been a tool. That sounds like I could have actually done that. It's easier than the, than yeah, the way think, it's been explained to me. Because it's impossible to just be like, oh, turn off your thoughts or to have a train. I know, I, I couldn't do that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think what they mean by this question, though, is, um, for, uh, for example, uh, in, in her uh, business, Madeline attracted a lot of narcissistic psychopaths. Because, you know, you would buy a, a something for a million dollars. Well, who has a million dollars to spend on a, a painting or, a, you know, whatever? Uh, only people that are born rich or people that have somehow uh, become billionaires, you know, and often they're in, in some form of mafia or, you know, something, whatever. So she would attract these people. And I would always say to her, why are you taking them? They're giving you all the signs that, that they, the guy came in with two bodyguards. He's a billionaire. Why would you have two bodyguards? Because she's recreating her childhood. She recreates her childhood. And then she says, oh, I'm stuck with these guys. And now I've got to do everything that they want for, you know, blah, 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 blah. And then they don't pay and they do this and they do that and they lie and they cheat. But once they walk through her door, she thinks she has to take them. And that's like her mother and father. I had to deal with them. So now now that they're in the door, she never has trouble with normal people. Do you think that Madeline was somehow addicted to the chaos of it all? I think she was addicted to the familiarity right. of it. The familiarity of it. Oh, I know this type. This is just like my mom. You know how when you meet someone who's just like your mom? Yeah. If your mom's nice, it's great. Yeah. You know, if she's not, you go, oh, she's just like my mom. I somehow I'm attached to her. Huh. Feeling trapped usually implies someone else has the power in a given scenario. This is, I would hear so many people say, I can't do it. I'm trapped. Right. And, and it, that line drives me wild because nobody is actually trapped. Example, woman, husband, awful, boring, you know, he only watches TV and he eats on a TV tray and doesn't talk to her ever. But she says, I can't leave him because I can't afford an apartment and I can't do this and I can't do that. And, you know, the children would hate me and, you know, all of this stuff. So I'm trapped with him. Right. She's making this up. Right. Her children would probably say, you know, I don't blame you. And if they didn't, so what? She has a right to be happy. But what? But this whole trapped business is like it, the definition of neurosis is wanting two things that are opposite equally. You huh. want them equally, but they're opposite. So it's like, I want to get out of this marriage. I am terrified to get out of this marriage because I'm really codependent and I need him. Right. So and, and it, so whenever anyone comes in and says they're trapped, I know that it, there's a whole lot going on that they're not looking at. Do you think also the the trapped narrative gives some people a badge of identity? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and take ridding that would would, would lose a part of their identity Mm -hmm. and what they lead with and what they talk about and what they entertain with. Yes. Poor mom. Poor mom. She has boring dad. Oh, it's so awful for her. Oh, Mm -hmm. I'm all right, kids. You know, that's the, you know, the martyring routine is part of it. 
And another part is, you know, well, we have a social circle, all that. But the big part of it is a fear of being alone. It seems like that's a, that fear is usually at the root of a lot of these mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. Huge, huge amount of fear. A narcissist would use an Uzi to kill a fly, as in disproportionate retaliation. One of my patients said that to me about his mother. He said she'd use an Uzi to kill a fly. And I thought it was such a perfect definition of, you know, a giant Uzi gun to kill a tiny fly. That's an example. That's what narcissists will do because they feel that threatened. Like, remember when uh, um, she was on the border of telling about the uh, decorator that she, that she had sex with, the gay decorator who wasn't really gay, right? And they went to Europe together. Um, when she almost told her father that, and then the, she, the mother said, oh, next day, sorry, the dog died. That's using an Uzi to kill a fly. So like both of both, you could say, well, why was, why were Madeline and, and Duncan so frightened of her? Because she would use an Uzi to kill a fly. Tell us about the marble theory that you told us about of a, a narcissist ego. A, okay, a, nar a human ego, normal person's ego, is, let's say it's this big and has 200 marbles, okay? A narcissist is has a tiny, tiny ego with like three marbles. So if you shoot one of those out by saying, hey, guess what, I think mom slept with blah, blah, blah. You shoot one of those out, they're like, I have to kill. There, there's, you know, I, to, I have to retaliate and it, and it, in, you may see it as a little thing. They see it as huge. So the best way, if you were coaching Madeline when she was in it mm -hmm. and she was a little girl, mm -hmm. what would you have told her to do with her mother as a narcissist? What would, how would you have told her to handle it? It's really hard. I, I, I When I worked at a psychiatric hospital, I would have chronic narcissists whose children were actually committed because they were so terribly screwed up. And then you would send them home for the weekend. They, you'd have them all week and they'd be fine by Friday. They'd come back on Monday, complete wrecks again. You know? Um, and I mean, it's really hard because you, you, your mother has all the power. When you live in a family that is trying to destroy you, you are like in a prisoner of war. You know, you're on the opposite camp and you're locked in there and you have no power at all. You know, I mean, there's all kinds of ways to say, how do I deal with my narcissistic mother-in-law? It's different. How do you deal with a narcissistic mother when you're five? Usually the husband uh, used to be when in the 80s and 70s, the husband just stays at work. You know, he just because they, they just want to get away from him. they just want to get away. So then, the, the, you know, so the narcissistic mother is then at home with the children, pestering the child. So mm -hmm. is there any tool that you could give someone who is a child of a narcissist? Nothing that's really works. I mean, you can say you need to get involved in all kinds of school activities. You need to go like um, one of the things Duncan said to her was when, when the mother uh, ruined all the furniture uh, with the knife. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah, yeah. Ruined the furniture. Uh, he said you need to spend more time with your grandmother, which was the best advice he could have ever given because grandmother was an antique specialist. And uh, she did then spend a great deal of time with the grandmother and the grandmother was normal. And that's why she got into her craft. That's right. That's right. So, I mean, it, 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 it in many ways saved her so that you could, she would, lay, like she would, she, her mother was also anorexic. And so when she, when she would come down for breakfast, her, her mother would say, don't eat that. You, do you want to be a fat tub? Honestly, it's only your mother that'll tell you what a fat tub you really are. But Madeline also ended up being so thin herself. Yes. Too, yes. which maybe is, has to do with her mother. Yeah, it might have. Yeah. Someone t once told me to deal with a narcissist that's in, in your family mm -hmm. to put him on stage. Mm -hmm. the, the, this person told me this is the only thing that you can do yeah. is just put him on stage. There's really nothing else to do. And it sounds like the tools are limited. When you say put them on stage, what do you mean? Let them have the attention. Give them the stage. Give them the attention. If, if it's a family gathering. Oh, like that, yeah. That's, yeah. They're very, very happy with put the attention. Put them on stage. They're very, very happy with the attention. But I say whenever you have, there's two narcissists, like a mother-in-law, for example, where you don't have that much power in the sense you can't get rid of her. Right. Right. But, but you're also an adult. Okay. I say never be alone in a room with them. It's a mistake. Because that's when they really care. They say the really most rotten things. Because no one's around. No one's around. And then later she twists it and says, you know, this happened. And then you, you say, well, I said that, but not in that context. Right. right? And then you're, so you realize, do not be in the same room with them. 
And also when they say, you are just terrible, Kathy. You have, you know, your child was home and, you know, he only knows a babysitter. He doesn't even know you. You, you just say, sorry, you feel that way. Never because express an emotion. And, never right. express an emotion to a narcissist because they love that. So if you said, oh, that makes me really sad, they would run around saying, oh, Kathy feels so guilty. Yeah. Yeah. They'd say, well, you should feel sad. Here you have this adorable little boy who's longing for his mother. You know, that they but just say, sorry, you feel that way. Never show them an, an ounce of weakness or that you are feeling any emotion that they're talking about, because it, eventually they'll stop if there's no if there if there's you know no energy. You literally have to give them no energy. Yeah, no energy whatsoever. Do you think that a big part of narcissism is that they're trying to make other people feel as bad as they feel inside? No. No, I think they feel terrified all the time and they think that the world is out to get them. Right. And it's very important for them when anybody says anything to kill them. Just, you know, just take an Uzi, kill, 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 kill. And that that and that they're so they're it's really an elaborate and very primitive defense. Mm -hmm. Going from fearing your mother to feeling sorry for her is a major turning point in your recovery. You're putting your needs above your mother's approval. She's lost the hold she once had on you. And you see that that has happened with the Madeline case when in the very end, she said, I actually kind of feel sorry for my mother. Uh, and, that's, and that's really when she's lost all her power. Because when, when she was a child, she lived in a, a horrible home and her mother, they didn't have any money. Uh, they, although they lived in a mansion, but they had no food and the father just walked out. And there, and there was no th such thing as alimony in the 30s. They just walked out. And so the mother pimped her out to rich relatives in uh, Newport and Martha's Vineyard in the summer. She was very pretty and said, don't come home without a husband. And I mean it. So that was her job. And she did exactly that. She met uh, Duncan at uh, Martha's Vineyard and hooked on to him. And so then Duncan, who's a complete worm and never stands up for anything, never allowed that mother in his house. So I have no idea what she did that, you know, what, the only thing that she ever said about her mother was she was mean, then she was pathetic. And if you ever struck her, she was a snake. So it's almost like passed down. Yeah. And yeah. then Madeline seemed to want to break the cycle with you. I don't think Madeline wanted to break the cycle. I think what happened is she, and not that she didn't want to be better, but she had debilitating anxiety. She, she was terrified of losing her business because that's how she's built her, her whole ego has been built on, I'm a successful businesswoman and she wouldn't let people fly because of her anxiety. And she was doing all kinds of things at, at work that were causing her business to fail. So she went like, oh my God, I have to be better for my business. She never thought she had to be better for herself. She thought, she thought, I'm fine. I just don't have any relationships. I'm fine. Um, but it was when her business was failing, she said, oh my God, I've got to do something about this. Was she open to therapy when you first came in? No, she was cold. Right. She was like, you know, okay. She said, I have the following things. And I said, well, I don't deal with uh, obsessive compulsive behavior. So you'll have to go to another doctor for that. I'm not a specialist in that. Go there, do, you know, do this, do this, do this. And I gave her this whole thing sheet. And then the next week I went and she says, I'm no better. Thanks for nothing. So I said, yeah, well, you won't be better in a week. And then I started just talking to her. She started talking about, she had a big picture on her desk of her dog. And so then I started talking to a writer dog, the dog the mother killed. Yes. Yeah. So I started talking to a writer dog. She became a real person. And, you know, she could say she loved the dog. She could say how important the dog was because the dog couldn't hurt her. How did you know to go for the dog? It's the only picture she had. And you know how people might have a picture of their dog on their desk? It's like this big. Yeah. Hers is this big, like a family shot of the dog. So you knew that there was something I, I thought there. like, wow, this is a really important dog. The mother killing the dog. Talk to us about that. I mean, that is out of control. Yeah. Well, the well, the mother was out of control. Yeah. When uh, they were at dinner at the country club, uh, she, the Madeline said, uh, "Well, what she he said, you haven't been home or, or lately, or your boyfriend hasn't been around." And she said, "Well, it's hard for him to be around when the kind of stuff that's going on in our house is happening." That's all. She didn't really say, "Mom slept with my boyfriend and we broke up and he had to leave." So the mother looked at her like, "Oh, you're going to bring this up." She said, oh, you'll be sorry for this. Just in a look. And the next day she took him to the vet and came home and said, unfortunately, Fred had cancer and it was 
riddled with cancer and we had to put him to sleep. And that's the psychopath in her. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 